So anyway, so yeah, so it turns out that, uh, like she said, we ended up making the news um, with FanX, and it was pretty dang exciting. So um, my name is Russ, and I own Squawk Box Sound and DJ Services, established in 2004. Um, from that time until now, we have serviced I think this year we are doing about 45 events a year. Um, anywhere ranging from school functions to uh, multi-million dollar mansion weddings. And I love what I do. And the whole journey of how I got into it has been long. I would say that for me, it is lifelong. I went too far. Let's go back one. So, power of music. As she was saying, she loves music. When I was <laughs> with her at that concert, uh, I had actually split my lip uh, open from a previous concert where I was, uh, we were crowd surfing or something, and then someone ended up landing on me and just, just busted my lip open and blood's everywhere. And, and so the next concert, I'm like, okay, I gotta be careful and not hurt myself. So that's why I stayed in the back and didn't go in the front because I didn't wanna you know, mess up my face any, any more than it already is. But, um, <laughs> power of music. Who here has ever cried listening to a song? Who here has ever had their joys just, just made greater by a song? Music has the power to connect people. And for me, music is a conduit. It's a gateway of emotions and me getting people to respond to what I think is important. And so, yes, you have those certain songs, you know, like the Cupid Shuffle and whatever, you know those people are gonna get out and dance to those silly songs because it's kind of ingrained, like, okay, to the left, okay, we got, you know, and you have it, and that's, that's how that works, but me, I like to find music that they haven't heard, but is kind of in the same wheelhouse of music that they might like, and I'll just kind of throw that in there and see reaction, because I want them to experience something that they haven't ever felt before and be brought together as a group in a way that will be memorable. So I'm mainly a wedding DJ. And as a wedding DJ, 10 years from now, you're not gonna remember what the bride wore. You're not gonna remember what you ate. You may remember the venue and kinda how it looked. The thing that you will remember the most at a wedding is the feel, the feel of the wedding. I create that. I get together with my couples and we talk about what is their vision of the evening. And then I take their vision and I make it happen. And that's what I do. For me, music has driven me. That's, that's me, yeah, the 70s. Um, so, uh, I don't want to get, well, actually, I do like to get personal. I, I like to get personal. I think that is the way that it's called being real, right? You, you tell people your experiences so that they can relate. Now, not, they will not take what you say the same way that you're trying to give out, but they might get an inkling of what's actually going on behind because we as people like to put up facades, we like to have our masks, we don't like to let people in, because we're gonna get hurt, people hurt us. I was raised by my, aunt, my uncle since I was two years old because my dad cheated on my mom and uh, caused her some mental instabilities um, and my grandparents raised me, they ended up serving an LDS mission in Dominican Republic and my aunt and my uncle took me in. Growing up, my, 
brother, he always liked to remind me that I wasn't part of the family. I wasn't even adopted, right? I was cousin, but yet I was there. And so that kind of created some, some deep-seated issues with me on a trust level of, uh, of relating with people. And I'm short, and I got picked on a lot for being short. But as I grew up, then I realized, oh yeah, people pick on people because they're tall or because they're fat or because they're skinny or whatever reason. And I realized as an adult, it happens to everybody. And that is how I started learning how to relate to people, is by finding things that are in common. So when I was little, okay, I'm not seeing this, this uh, slide, hold on. There we go, okay. Um, so when I was little, I would sit in the back of this van. We, we didn't have seat belts back when I was a kid. But we could like go all over. I would go underneath the seats of the van and fall asleep. And my parents would be looking for me for hours trying to figure out where the hell is Russ? And I'm asleep underneath of the van. Um, and I would pretend like I was leading the orchestra when I was two years old. And I loved music. And I started learning how to uh, play piano. I actually took from um, John Schmidt's mom and John Schmidt later. And I would borrow my sister's tapes. And when I mean borrow, I probably still have them. Uh, um, and I would listen to music. Like they were listening to this stuff that I had never, I mean, because my parents, they were, they were older, so they listened to like big band uh, and like Elvis and, and, and stuff like that, which was, uh, growing up, that was boring. And my sisters were listening to like this new age, like English beat and new order and all these kind of cool bands that, uh, and uh, Steel Pulse, oh man, Steel Pulse. I don't know if any of you guys, anyone here like reggae? Thank you, thank you, some people. Okay, I tell you what, if you need some good, chill, I gotta get homework done music, reggae is where it's at. It, it really is. Um, and so, growing up, my coping mechanism became music. So I wore headphones pretty much my whole high school. N now, personally, I'm, I'm outgoing. I, my nature is to be outgoing. And so I would talk to people and I made a lot of friends and people would say to me, Russ, how come you're friends with so-and-so who's Hispanic and in a, in a gang? I didn't care if he was Hispanic and in a gang. He was my friend. And I treated everybody equally because I knew what it was like to feel like crap. And, but even then, I didn't let people in. I mean, I was friends with them, but it wasn't like, hey, let's go hang out and go do things. And when I had an opportunity to get a job, that's the first thing I did, is I went out and got a job, and I worked my butt off, and I spent every single penny that I ever made in high school. So for those of you who are working and now in college, you probably feel me. You probably think, why the hell didn't I save more money? Right? Yeah. So. Um, in that, I, I served an LDS mission, and um, that was one of the hardest things for me, to go from listening 24-7 to music to not having the music that I wanted to hear. And instead, I was singing hymns, and every once in a while, we'd be on a bus, and we'd catch uh, a, a couple measures of like, um, for some reason, they really liked Creedence Clearwater. And the, uh, uh, have you ever seen the rain coming down on a sunny day would play. The funny thing is, is I was in Belang up on the Amazon and it was just that. I mean, it'd be, it'd be blue skies and all of a sudden <laughs> rain would come down. I'm like, and we'd hear the song and be like, okay, that's, that's, that's the one thing that's, that's American that, that keeps me sane while I'm 
listening to all kinds of music. But, of course, when I left my mission, I left with a, uh, a case, my whole suitcase. I'd given away all my clothes and loaded it with music <laughs> because that's what I do. I love music. So um, on, in the mission field, we had a guy who played in a band, and we'd go over and we taught him. And he's like, here, Russ, pick up this, this guitar. And he's like, here, let me show you some chords. And everything that I played was a bass line. Everything. I mean, he'd be like, here, Russ, play this. And I'm like, do, 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 no, no, he's all, no, 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 no. You gotta, I'm like, no, 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 do, 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 you know. So he's, so he's like, okay, Russ, you need to learn to play the bass. So when I got home from my mission, that's what I did, is I picked up bass and started a band. It was called, wait for it, Squawk Box, right? I mean, we haven't gone too far from, from beginnings. Um, and it was called the Squawk Box because we were poor. And our PA system consisted of this little tiny speaker that you could plug directly into from Radio Shack, and we called it the Squawk Box. Because it sounded like the mom on the peanuts, wah, 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 whenever you would sing with everybody else, you couldn't hear it. And we had a trumpet player who had a mute, and it, it, it worked out really nicely. So what, what did I do? So my question to you, if anyone would like to answer, is what drives you? What is your passion? Is anyone interested in, in sharing what your passion is? Jen? Teaching. Jen's passion is teaching. Anybody else? Helping animals or others. Your passion is helping animals or others. That's my daughter's passion. My daughter loves animals. And she will find strays and bring them home, and it's crazy. Singing when, I work. Singing, when I work. singing when you work. I'm lucky. I have a job that promotes me to sing while I work. I get paid to sing terribly, terribly. So, uh, let's see. Let's go to the next. So in my business, I have found that anything we do is customer oriented. If you do not like people, do not start your own business. I'm telling you that right now. It, it, just, just like working at Target will make you hate people, Owning your own business will make you hate people. Not everybody, not everybody. But when I have a client that calls me up and says, hey Russ, I'm a poor student and we're getting married and I need some, some, some discount on your services and over the phone we talk, I'm like, oh yeah, sure, you know what? Hey, I'd be happy to help you out. And then they show up in their brand new BMW and they're getting married at Lakai and, they're, and I'm giving them a, like a $200 discount off my services. And I'm kicking myself saying, dude, their parents could afford to pay me more. But they, they, they tricked me, right? And it teaches you a valuable lesson. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so this, this is one of my favorite things. This just happened this summer. Um, our client... They left from their wedding to go to the Dominican Republic for their honeymoon. And he says, hey Russ, I'm writing you from the lobby bar of our hotel in the DR right now. I just want to say thanks for this weekend and let tell you that you did an awesome job. Throughout the whole night, you kicked ass. Thanks again. I'd be happy to write up a review or testimonial somewhere. Just let me know. That is what makes my job worth it. He liked what I did so much that he sent me a message on his wedding, on his honeymoon, while he's sitting in the lobby, waiting to go out. And what does that tell you? That tells you that I was able to touch him, that I was able to reach him and do not only a good job as a DJ, but that I was able to connect on, a, on another level. And that's what you want, because those are the people that will come back to you. So how do you get there? 
What are your clients' needs? When you go into business, yes, if you're making something, you're thinking, okay, you know what? I'm trying to fill a need. I'm going to make something. But it's not you who's going to, to sell those things and have people buy them. It's the need that people have that will make them want to buy it. So the number one way to sell yourself or your product is you make the client feel important. How do you make a client feel important? Do you guys have any ideas? Any ideas on, on what, can you, what can you do to make a client feel important? You can play them the music that you like. Right. If you are working with animals and they bring in their animal by you showing that their animal is important to you by treating the animal kind. I mean, if like you pick up the animal and throw, you know. But no, there, no one's going to want to come and, and, and to, your, to your clinic or whatever you're doing, right? So it's making people feel important. And you do that by actively listen. So like you said, play music that they want to hear. Well, how do I know what they want to hear? I have to analyze them. As a DJ, I judge people. I do. I look at you and say, oh, that's a hipster. <laughs> oh, that's a, a yuppie. Oh, that's a, you know, whatever. I, I do. But I do it not, not as in I'm better than you, but as, ooh, because of what they're wearing or because of how they're acting, I bet that they would like this kind of music. So I read people. So I actively listen to find out what is going to make them want to hire me. What is going to make them have an enjoyable experience. And then I feel their needs. I say, okay, what are your needs? And I'll tell you what, half the time, the clients have no idea what their needs are. I want a DJ and I want to spend $200. I want to spend $300. Okay. I can get you a DJ for, for $200 or $300. He will show up with a laptop and two speakers that are probably pretty old. And he won't meet with you beforehand and he'll just play. That was my experience when I got married. This was back when they did CDs. And I tell you what, I will never let what happened at my wedding happen to anybody else. We didn't meet with him beforehand. He didn't have our special song. That was our song. And my sister-in-law ended up picking out a song that was similar, and we danced to that for our first dance. Here it is, 17 years later, and I'm still pissed about it. That tells you the power of filling the client's needs. That's what you want to do. And then, after you've filled their needs, you go above and beyond, because that's how you get repeat business. I have a client that we are friends that still tells other people to this day we did this wedding, and Russ was emptying garbages. I was their DJ, and I was emptying garbages. Why? Because staff wasn't doing it. There was nobody there to do it. So I did it, because it needed to be done. So you find what needs to be done, and then you fill that need, because half the time they won't know what that need is, and you go above and beyond that. And then, you seek their input. You get feedback. You find out, what did I do well? What did I do okay? What did I ter do terribly? How can I improve? And you don't do this for an ego trip of saying, look how cool I am. I got a five-star review. They think I'm awesome. I prefer four and three-star reviews. Not because I want them, but because it means my client is being honest with me and telling me what they really think. If my client says, oh, you guys are so amazing, and hopefully that's exactly what I want. I want that five-star review. 
but I don't shy away from those other reviews and I don't delete those other reviews because I want that feedback of how I can do better. I had a client where we had met a couple of times and we had gone over everything and everything was perfect. We knew exactly what we were gonna do. Day of the wedding, mother-in-law comes in. Changes everything and is hovering over me while I'm trying to, to, to do my job saying, what are you gonna play next? What are you gonna play next? Why are you playing that song? You should play this song. And completely threw me off my game. Did I get a good review from the bride and groom? They gave me a, they gave me a, a decent review, they gave me a four. But they said that I was frustrated. Well, yeah, of course I was frustrated got this woman in my ears saying, dude, you're not doing what they want, but yet everybody was dancing. If you're going to hire somebody, let them do their job, right? But at the same time, they're the client, and it's my job to cater to what they want. And so I ended up doing exactly that, just rotating through songs really quickly, and half the time I'd rotate through songs, people would go, oh, and the mom would be like, oh, don't worry about it, it's, we're, we're fine, we're, we're gonna move on. Okay. Should I have stood up and said, you know what, hey, let me do my job? In hindsight, yeah, I should have. But I didn't want the family to be mad at me afterwards. So, there's that. Again, if you're not ready to own your own business uh, and like people, it, you will hate people afterwards. Um, so use that feedback to improve. So um, the greatest thing that anyone ever told me was, uh, Russ, you suck at speaking. <laughs> okay. So... I went and took classes and I shadowed people who were much better than I was until I was more comfortable talking in front of an audience. Because as a DJ, for me, for weddings, that's what I do is I will say, hey, we're gonna cut the, cut the cake, we're gonna do the first dance, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And it was getting comfortable doing that. Um, so how are you guys gonna customize to your clients? What are you going to do to be different than everybody else? What are you going to do that will make you stand out? So is everybody having fun? Yeah, no? Somebody's asleep in the back, that, that's okay. So you got a plan for success. You build a foundation. What you guys are doing right now is building that foundation. Um, for me, when I'm about to get ready for, um, to, to prep music, I get out some water, maybe some kickstart, throw on some, some good tunes, and I go over in my mind with our meetings with them and what's going on, and, and I prep. But to get to where I was, I had to have a business plan. We did a wedding where <laughs> oh, oh, they, uh, the bride and groom got in a fight because the, bri the bridesmaid was hitting and dancing, grinding on the groom at the wedding. So during this time, it started to rain and they were so worried about their little altercation that we had to kind of fend for ourselves and get ourselves and our equipment taken care of. <laughs> so in part of your business plan, you may think, okay, I'm gonna do this, this, and this, and this, but things are gonna pop up. Things that you have never expected are going to happen. And so now in my contract, I have, hey, in case of rain, I need time to secure my equipment and you are going to help me and if it gets damaged, then you are going to cover the cost of repairing my equipment. That was something I didn't think of originally. And that's how my contract has evolved, is by experiencing things and going, oh, I wish that was in my contract. Because 
I did it all by myself. My wife and I, what had happened, uh, well, we're going to get into that in a sec. Um, prepare your forms. Think of the different things that you or your client is going to need, whether it be a database, whether it be a website, whatever you want. Build what you think is going to work. And if it is something that is actual tangible, then build your inventory. If it's not something that's tangible, for me, my inventory is music, right? I pay a monthly subscription to uh, promo only, which gives me the same songs that are hitting the radio uh, right when the DJ, other DJs receive it, so that I can hear what's going to be popular or what I think is going to be popular and then promote what I think is going to work for me. Uh, I got to tell you guys this terrible story. So, as a wedding DJ, what do you think is the worst thing that you can do to a bride? What do you think? Yeah, what do you think? Blue shirt, blue white shirt. Yeah, you. What's the, th what's the worst thing you can do to a bride on her wedding day? Anyone else have any ideas? What? Not show up on time. What's, what's even worse than not showing up on time? Not showing up. So I had a DJ two weeks ago, three weeks ago, call me. Russ, I am at work. I messed up on my schedule. I have a wedding that starts in an hour. Can you cover for me? Sorry, dude. I can't cover for you. I have my own event starting in two hours. But I'll help you find someone. And we did. We went and, and find someone. And everything worked out all right. But the bride will always remember that she had to call her DJ on her wedding day to say, where the hell are you? You do not want that for your clients. In whatever you do, you do not want that. So, you calendar. And I would s always suggest you keep a hard calendar. I do everything on my phone, but there has been more than once where my phone updates or something happens and I lose everything. Always have backup. Whether, and we, with your to-do lists, you need to think, okay, what do I have going on today? What do I have going on this week? What do I have going on this month? What do I have going on in the year? And you build your to-do lists according to what you want to accomplish in those parameters. So, contract, 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 right? If you own your own business, never, do work for anybody. Family, doesn't matter. Never do work for anybody without a contract. Why do you guys think you shouldn't do anything without a contract? I mean, hey, it's your best friend. What could go wrong? Right? I have done events where people have promised me the moon. Russ, I can't pay you right now. Hey, we're good friends. Please do my event and when I get some money, I'll pay you. Do you think I've seen that money? Nope, I haven't. Do I let it ruin my relationship with them? No, that's not the kind of person I am. But always have a contract. That way, they know what to expect and you know what to expect. It protects you guys both. And um, even though I do run my own DJ company, I work as a paralegal doing collections. Um, I work for a, a, an attorney and we do contracts. That's what we do is we enforce contracts. So that's why you should always have a contract. Like I was saying with that one bride, never make your client contact you unless it's to initiate a relationship. Be proactive. Contact your clients. If you say, hey, let's schedule a meeting in three weeks, 
that means that in two weeks, you are contacting them to schedule that meeting. You do not let them contact you. You be proactive because if you want their business, you gotta work for it, right? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. I'm sure you guys have heard that time and time again, right? It's true, if you do not build a business plan, then you will fail. Not necessarily today, well, maybe, you f maybe it is that you fail today and you can, you can start over, because each, each day is a new day. Each day is a time to make up for that. Isn't that scary? There's a lot of crazy stuff going on with clowns this, this week, isn't there? Face your fears. Anyone in the room, what are you not good at? Be honest, what are you not good at? Cooking. I am a great cook, sorry, sorry. But, so what do you do? What do you do to get to be a better cook? Yeah, you have to cook. I am afraid of sharks. I'm afraid of pool sharks. Do you guys know what pool sharks are? So you're, you're in the swimming pool, it's late at night, you're swimming there, you're hanging out, your friends go to get in the hot tub or something, and all of a sudden you realize, hey, I'm in the deep end by myself, and there's a shark underneath me. Of course there's not, but in your head, there's a shark, right? I don't know, I, I watched Jaws when I was really little, it scarred me for life, it, it's, it's terrible. Don't be serious, make work fun, I went through a period in my business where I was depressed. I didn't know how to get myself out of the rut and it sucked and I didn't know what to do. And all my events were just kind of cookie cutter and I feel really badly for those clients during that time period because I did not put my heart into it. And, and it sucked. So, Change your attitude. You do not choose how things go on around you, but you choose how you react. So choose to be positive in your reaction. Choose to let things wash over you. So watch out for ruts and freaking sharks, right? There are fears that you fear that are not real. They are just not real. When you are texting that girl that you think is cute or that guy that you think is cute and, you, and you're talking to him back and forth and all of a sudden you get nothing and a day goes by and still nothing and you're thinking, oh, they don't like me. Right? And then you find out later, oh, well they had a family emergency or, they let, or their phone died or something else happened and your fear was completely baseless. Has that ever happened to anybody here? Yeah. So, don't let your fears overcome you. And find out what you're afraid of to do in your business that you want to create, and you tackle it. That right there, that's my one move. So, I can, I can do this all day long, but that, see her, see her reaction? They're like, holy crap, look what he can do. That's my only move. Don't ask me to do anything else. So you find something that makes you stand out. And um, I was gonna tell you about this man. Oh, I'll do it anyway real quick. So there is, is a guy who wanted a 66 SS Corvette and he saved all his money and that was his baby and he loved that car. Then he found out that he was going to be a dad. The first thing he did was he sold his car to put towards a down payment for a house and start a business. So in your life you may have a priority and you may think it's a priority. In your life priorities will change things will be different and they will happen at the blink of an eye. 
So be prepared for those. But you're not alone, so take advice, have confidence in yourself, trust your instincts. One of the first major gigs that we got um, was doing a beach party, and we had, uh, they had contacted us and said, hey, will you give us a demo of what you would do at a beach party? And all of our friends and family were like, just beach boys, beach boys, beach boys. Pfft, beach boys. So we did a whole mix of music, sent that into them, and we have now been DJing that event for 10 years. So trust your instincts. When people tell you that you can't do something, you can, but invite them to help. Kevin Hart, awesome guy. He struggled for 19 years trying to break into the movie business, getting kind of small parts here and there, and now he is major. The executives told him, you are too short. See, see, I'm, I'm short, so I, he gives me hope. Um, they said, you are black. They said, you are not funny enough. They said, you are this and that and whatever. It took him 19 years, and he has proven them wrong because he kept at it. And so when you, do, when you start your business, keep at it. This is my competition. They are not my competition. Over the last couple of years, I have realized that my competition are actually my friends. We call them frienders. Vendors and friends, frienders. Why? Because they will push you. That competition means that you are racing against them, right? And you're trying to do better, and you're trying to go faster, and you're trying to, to, to be the best. My competition I used to think that they were stealing money and food from my kids' mouths. That is not the case. Your competition are going to be your friends in the industry and give you valuable advice. I went from charging $75 for my very first gig to this last month, I booked an event, $1,400. One evening. And I did that through networking, through my competition. Because I, instead of treating them as enemies, became their friends. And now the whole industry in Salt Lake has been raised because of it. So build a support group of people that will help you. Surround yourself with success. If you want to know how to do something well, find somebody who is semi not maybe not exactly doing what you're doing, or maybe they are. Find somebody that does what you want to do great and become their friend. And I don't mean as in, hey, I'm your friend while you're teaching me something. I mean actually get to know them and become their friend. I have, I have a DJ that I worked with, and his dad is, is in VA and not doing well. And I'll call him up and say, hey, how's your dad doing? Not because I want anything from him, but because legitimately I care about how his dad is doing. And he does the same thing with my mom. So get out of your comfort zone. The best thing I ever did was go to one of those DJ meetings where I was surrounded by a whole bunch of DJs that were way better than me. Because it put me out of my comfort zone and then in talking to them realizing, oh wait, I can do this. So you reach out to others. Don't turn away your cheerleaders. Do you guys know what cheerleaders are? In the business world, a cheerleader is somebody who's like, yay, Russ, you're the best, I love you. But sometimes they're really annoying. Because sometimes it's that one guy that you're like, ah, oh, dude, if I saw him on the street, I'd be like, oh. Don't turn away your cheerleaders. Why? Because they really actually do want your success and they don't care. So who will drive you to be better than you are today? Uh, don't give up. Kevin Hart, man, don't give up. There is no overnight success. Expect rejection from your family. Expect that you will be treated like crap for following your dreams, because they will. They will say, Russ, why are you out DJing a gig instead of being to, you know, grandma's birthday party that we just decided to plan? Well, I have a responsibility. No, 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 you should be with the family. 
your family may or may not understand what you're going through. You may fail, and you will have to spend money to make money. So you make those positive adjustments to correct. Now, if you have friends that are trying to do a business, you should support them before you support the Kanye's, before you support Nike, before you support Dre Beats. Support your friends because the only way they're gonna make it big is if you support them. Um, exposure, uh, that we don't have time for that. Market your value. Your most valuable resource is time. And there's a fine line between I'm doing an event for free and between exposure and building your audience base. You may think, well, I'm only a $200 DJ or I'm only a $300 DJ or I'm only a veterinarian that can charge this much or, or whatever it is. Do not undervalue yourself. People will pay for your services if you know what you're doing. And your customers can become your best cheerleaders. I have a client that 10 years ago we DJed for them and every year I do a wedding because of a referral from them. So what's your time worth? I want to tell you about my friend KJ, but we don't have time. So um, pay your friends. If, you are, if your friends are coming to help you, pay them. Do not burn bridges. If you, if you do not pay your friends what they're worth, even if you're taking a loss, they will not want to come help you. Now, they may come because, hey, we're having fun and whatever else, depending. But if you're asking to, for them to sacrifice their time, you should pay them. And try to avoid business with close family because it usually ends up poorly. And life is too short, so spend your focus on happy things, things that are gonna work for you, and don't worry about what anybody else is doing. If you have an idea and you wanna pursue it, you do it. So here's your takeaways that I think, I think for starting your own business, these are the things that are important. You have to be passionate. You have to save your earnings for business purchases. Because that's what we do, is, is we would take 10% of whatever we earned and we put it back into the business. And we also charge 10% of whatever our equipment and time costs, and that's what we charge our clients. So we make, you make a client feel important. You become organized and prepared. Don't do it alone. Don't do what I did and be prideful and think, oh, I'm a DJ, I know what I'm doing. My game has completely raised to the next level by involving others. Remember that it won't start, if you start a business now, it may be 20 years before you actually become huge and become what you think is success. So build a support group. Learn from other successes and mistakes. Always have a contract. Have licenses, insurance, and pay your taxes. Choose to be positive. Charge what you're worth and pay employees what they're worth. As she was saying, I did DJ for Joey Fatone. We were on the news. It wasn't because of my skill as a DJ, though. It was because of networking. I had a friend who knew him. When he was in Salt Lake, he tweeted out, is there another DJ that can com come and help? And she contacted me and we did it. So I started out with that little squawk box, right? That's my current setup. I run two bows, which cost about a, two grand a piece. Um, and my sound is impeccable because I want my clients to have the best experience available. If any of you guys do want to follow me, uh, I am on all the different multimedia platforms and I would be happy to chat with you guys even though you may not be doing what I'm doing if you want a mentor want somebody to help you if I have time I would love to help you because I find joy in making other people happy that's why I'm a DJ and thank you guys so much for your time <laughs>